Good morning, church. I want to welcome you to our online service at the Central Church of Christ. And if you are one of our members, I want to encourage you, and you're watching this on Facebook, as I say each week, please like and share this post so that it will uh, the message of God will venture out to others other than just yourself. I also want to welcome any guests that are watching this morning. And if you're a guest, we want to let you know that we have begun in-person services. We have three in-person services at our church building at the corner of College and Huntoon. If you'd like to participate in one of those in-person services, please contact us at the church office. We'll be glad to let you know times, and you could let us know what date you're coming, and we'll make sure there's adequate seating for you and still remain social, still practicing social distancing. Uh, you can contact us. You can find our contact information on our website, centralchurchofchristtopeka.com. I also want to encourage you to grab your communion supplies, grab your Bible, and pen and paper. I want to invite the children to come, sixth grade and below, to get up close to the device. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll have a children's message and want to invite them on down. I want to remind you that beginning in the morning, we have an intergenerational work camp. We'll be uh, doing some service projects at, the, uh, Rob at Robinson Middle School, just a few blocks from our church building. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Maybe you're watching this later in the day on Sunday or maybe on Saturday because you're not able to uh, attend on Sunday morning but you are able to come out one of those mornings, Monday through Thursday of this week, and serve. If you have questions, please contact myself or Aaron Partlow. We begin this week a study of the Beatitudes. As a matter of fact, we'll be in a study of the Beatitudes from today through the end of August. And as we do that, uh, the Beatitudes are the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And as we think about the Sermon on the Mount, I think it's always important when we begin a study of the Sermon on the Mount to kind of see how the crowds reacted to Jesus' teaching. And so I want us to go to the end of the Sermon on the Mount and see the reaction to Jesus' teaching, including, but not exclusively, the Beatitudes. And so we want to look at how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Matthew 7, 24 through 29, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And now let's see how the crowds reacted to the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Our loving God, we choose this day to be your servants. We yield the right to command and demand. We give up our need to manage and control. We relinquish all schemes of manipulation and exploitation. We do all of this for Jesus' sake as his lifelong disciples. In the name of Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you uh, kind of joined me for this children's message. Glad that you got closer to the device. This morning, I, I want to use a movie, and it, it, I think it might be some of, your, some of you might really like this movie. I'm going to guess almost all of you, if not all of you, have watched one version of the movie, if not both. And the movie I'm talking about is The Lion King. And I want to use the Lion King this morning to help us understand a word. And I'm going to tell you up front, that word is disciple. And so we're going to use Mephasa and Simba to help us understand this idea of being a disciple. And so this morning, I want us to think about Mephasa. Mephasa was a powerful king. He ruled from Pride Rock. And he, but he was a loving and forgiving father, but he had expectations for Simba, his son, to follow in his footsteps and to follow his direction. Simba, when he followed his father and when he learned from his father, it seems that all goes well. But when Simba chooses to venture out on his own and he doesn't follow his father's wishes, but follows his own wishes, he gets in trouble. I want you to know that being a disciple is like that. 
And, and what I mean by being a disciple is like that is, see, when Simba is learning from and following his father, when he's doing that, it, it's even in the midst of bad times, things go right. Now, I'm not saying that things always are perfect, but I'm saying they go right. They go the direction that they should go. Well, the same is true. We have a king. His name is Jesus. I mean, Mephasa was the king of the lions and the king of the pride. But Jesus is king of the universe. Jesus is the creator of the universe. Jesus is the, creator of, is the king of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus and God, and we focus on, on, on God for a moment, God is a loving father. Jesus is a loving and forgiving king. And when we follow Jesus and when we learn from Jesus, all goes well. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is, is uh, without problems, but it means all is right. Even in bad times, if we follow Jesus and learn from Jesus, we seem to find peace. We seem to find contentment. I'm thinking about a time when, when I was in uh, just a little bit older than you. I was in seventh grade. I was a Boy Scout camp out. And there was actually a tornado coming through. It was a camp out, and it just so happened my dad was in the tent with my best friend Kent and myself. And as the tornado was passing by, the winds got up incredibly. I didn't know what to do. Kent didn't know what to do. But my dad instructed us on how to keep the tent in place. And we followed his lead. We followed his instructions. We learned from him. Well, that's what it's like following Jesus. That's what it's like being a disciple of Jesus. And not following our own wishes, but following the wishes of someone who knows. And Jesus knows us best. Jesus knows us best because He created us. And so I want to encourage you to know this morning that by following Jesus, by learning from Jesus, you can choose to be a disciple of Jesus. Beginning this morning through the end of August, we're going to be taking a look at the Beatitudes. And as we take a look at the Beatitudes, I'm excited about this because later in the fall or in the first of next year in 2021, we're going to be taking a look at the Sermon on the Mount. But as I looked back when I, when I thought about how long it had been since we'd actually studied the Sermon on the Mount together, it's been all the, almost nine years now. By the time we get to next, uh, next spring, it'll be almost 10 years. And so as we think about that, as we think about looking at the Sermon on the Mount, it, I want us to take a little bit longer look at the Beatitudes. I think they're going to be great for the amount of time we have for our sermons right now that we're doing online worship and having three in-person services and having shorter sermon times. And so I think it'll be a great fit for this time. But it's also something that I, that I feel called to do at this time. I want to spend more time in the Beatitudes, and then we'll look at, get into the Sermon on the Mount. But as we think about that, I want us to look at the context of both the Beatitudes and the larger sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And as we think about that context, we've already read the end. We've read Jesus' last part, the, 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 the uh, parable, if you will, of the, the wise and the foolish builders. The wise man builds his house on the rock and the foolish on the sand. And that the one who builds his house on the rock is the one that obeys the words of Jesus. But right after that, we see that the crowds, the crowds we'll read about in just a minute, we'll see that the crowds, we'll see that the crowds saw that Jesus taught as one who had authority. But I want us to go back now. What's taking place before the sermon begins? What's taking place before the Beatitudes begin? And so I want to begin reading in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. 
Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. I want you to know that as we begin looking at this text, Jesus is calling his closest followers. He's calling some of the apostles. He's calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John, part of the 12 specific disciples. But I want you to notice he's asking them to leave their former way of life to follow Jesus. I want you to know this morning that following Jesus is half of the definition of disciple. And as we think about this morning of following Jesus as becoming a disciple, I want us to keep our eyes and our focus on Peter. So we'll come back to him in just a second, but I want us to see what else is going on in our context. I want us to see that God's kingdom has come and is coming into the world through Jesus. And as the, God's kingdom is coming into the world, Jesus is teaching and preaching about God's kingdom. Jesus is healing those of various illnesses, and He's casting out demons. He's conquering. He's conquering the evil forces of the evil one. But I want you to notice that as Jesus is doing all of these things, as God's kingdom is coming into the world through Jesus, I want you to know that He's drawing a crowd. A lot of people are beginning to fall. Notice that they're coming from the Decapolis and the other side of the Jordan and from Galilee and from Judea. And they're following Jesus. But I want you to know when the crowd got close, He went on a mountainside when He saw the crowd. And it's reminiscent of Mount Sinai. At the beginning of the covenant with the, uh, of the Old Testament with the Jews, J Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, and it's reminiscent of that. I, I don't think that's by accident. I think Matthew wants us to make that connection. But Jesus takes, uh, uh, does something else. He sits down. He takes the posture. He takes the posture of a rabbi or a teacher of his day. And then I also want you to notice he begins teaching when the disciples come to him. Well, are those disciples the twelve? Are they the four that were just called? Are they the t all twelve? Or are they additional followers? Maybe is it the crowd? I don't know, and I don't know that it's important for us to know, and I don't know that it's important for Matthew for us to know. But what I do know that Matthew does want us to know, because we've already looked there, is that the crowd listened. And the crowd believed that Jesus spoke as one who had authority. We saw that in our scripture reading. I want you to know this morning that being a disciple is a lifelong journey of transformation. I ask to keep our focus on Peter. I want to go back to Peter for a minute. And I want us to think about Peter's lifelong journey of transformation. His journey of, as a disciple, a follower, a student of Jesus. I want you to notice that in Matthew chapter 16, we see that this, this ups and downs of his journey... Matthew chapter 16, beginning about verse 13, Jesus, they're in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asks His followers, Who do people say that I am? And after giving several answers, He says, Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter boldly speaks up, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, That didn't come on your own. That came from my Father who's in heaven. In just a split second, in just a few minutes, at least in the text, Jesus begins describing how he will be tortured and that he will die and he'll resurrect on the third day. And Peter says, no way, Lord, you're not going to die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Now, he may have actually been looking at Satan. Or maybe those are words to Peter because Peter's acting like Satan. But then there's a struggle with racism. There's a struggle in Peter's life. I mean, in, in Acts chapter 10, he is introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius. He actually is introduced to the, the idea of the Gentiles being a part of God's kingdom. 
And then he goes and preaches to Cornelius, a Gentile, and his household. And they become converts. They become Christians. Acts 11, Acts 15, Peter recounts and speaks, recounts the conversion, but he also speaks on behalf of the Gentile Christians. But then sometime later in Acts chapter, excuse me, in, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul recounts a time where Peter is in Antioch. And there in Antioch, he's, he's, he's eating and having a good time with the Gentile Christians. Until some Christians, Jewish Christians, come up from Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, he turns his back on. He, he has nothing more to do with the Gentile Christians. Again, we see that it is a lifelong journey of becoming a follower, a disciple of Jesus, to being transformed into the image of Jesus. Being a disciple is a lifelong journey of transformation. As I said in the children's message, you can, we can be disciples. Hopefully most of us are disciples of Jesus that are, are listening to this. But if not, it is possible for us to choose to be a disciple. We've been invited to leave our old way of life. And so when we become a disciple, it involves two things. It involves being a student, a learner at the feet of Jesus. Just like the people at the side of the mountain who had come, the crowd that had come, the disciples who had come. It's, it's like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus in her and her sister's home. It's like Paul sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. It is being a student. Disciples being a student, learning. And it's a lifelong journey. I, I've, I've got to guess that I have read in its entirety the Sermon on the Mount more than 50 times. I've taught it several times. I've heard it taught more times than I've taught it. And in that all said, I still, every time I go back to the Sermon on the Mount, again, it impacts my life. It impacts my life in a different, a new way. And that's the way it is going to being a student of our Master Jesus, following our Master Rabbi Jesus. As we do that, we're going to continue to learn. But it's also meaning being a follower. Follower and following the pattern of life, following the lifestyle of Jesus. And in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, we're going to see what that lifestyle looks like. Jesus preaches about, but then He also gives us an example of what it looks like through His life and that we see through the four Gospels. So here's the challenge for this week. I want to challenge all of us to memorize the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 13 through 12. Excuse me, Matthew 5, 3 through 12. And you say, oh, Terry, that's a lot. We ask that of our children. That's one of the leaves that they can memorize and put on the tree of knowledge. And so I think it would be good for all of us to internalize, to memorize and meditate on that passage. And so I want to encourage us to memorize the Beatitudes. And on July 12th, on, on July, excuse me, on July 19th, on July 12th, we're going to take a look at the word blessing and, and kind of break that down and look at some other passages in the Old and New Testament to see what the blessing, really what that means, blessed, what it really means. But we're also going to, on July 19th, we're going to begin looking at the very first of the Beatitudes. And when we do that, I want us to recite just the first one, just verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So that's your challenge for this week, to internalize a portion of God's Word that we know as the Beatitudes. For communion this morning, you may want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 17. And we'll read a part of that before the bread and a part of that before the cup. And so let's begin by reading in verse 17 and following. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. 
When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who, had betray, who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. Jesus was invited. It should be a, excuse me, Judas was invited to the, to the dinner. It should be a clear indicator that I'm invited along with my imperfections. Judas was invited to the supper. He was invited to the Lord's Supper amidst his imperfections. All of the apostles were. And it should be a clear indicator that I'm invited in spite of with my imperfections. This table is a reminder that Jesus is the one who perfects my imperfections. Let's pray. Father, I often wonder why we, your imperfect creation, are invited to this special celebration. Your invitation to partake of this bread is not because of my worthiness. The invitation is based on your Son's giving of His body to perfect our imperfections. Father, thank You for the gift of Jesus' body hung on the cross. In Jesus' name, precious name, we pray. Amen. Continue reading in Matthew chapter 26, beginning of verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to His disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is My body. Then He took a cup, and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is My blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus promised that His blood would be poured out for their and our forgiveness. Remember, Judas is still at the table. Judas could have been forgiven like the others. He could have been forgiven like Peter was forgiven after he denied knowing Jesus three times. He could have been forgiven like me in all of my sin and all of my imperfections. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus, the blood poured out for our forgiveness. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. During the pandemic, I have visited with minister friends from around the country. And until last week, each one had reported to me that their weekly giving, the weekly giving at their church, had been at or had exceeded the level of giving prior to the pandemic. This week, I visited with a friend whose congregation has experienced many, several job losses within their congregation. Our leadership continues to be impressed at the way God is influencing us to continue to be generous, to be a generous congregation. Please remember that you may give online or by mailing your contribution to the church. I want to end as I have for the last three months. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace.